Good morning, church. It's good to be back with you. You know, last week I had to almost reintroduce myself because it had been so long. And then on Monday, I was at the Sugar Grove campus and ran into uh, Pastor Keith and Pastor Nico talking. And uh, there was a scheduling conflict. And Keith says to me, well, you know... Would you like to? And I said, yes, I'll go. Um, before um, any of you could respond and tell them how things went last week. Um, and it's funny because we do that, right? We, we, uh, we worry about the way other people perceive us. And, and it, it was really interesting. I, I like to watch as people come in and out of services. And I was watching some younger girls this morning as they saw one another and the joy on their face was palpable and you didn't have any of that oh is it going to be okay because they're not quite old enough for that to hit right and we're we get older and we get obsessed with who we are right and and what do people think of me don't you know who I am right or or who do you think you are? Or maybe I don't even know who you are anymore. Or who am I? And we are obsessed with our identity and we sing songs like Come As You Are, but we don't tend to live that way, do we? We want to fit in. And we are born into families and we're young in elementary school, we kind of start gaining our personalities and figuring out where we fit in the pecking order. And then we hit junior high, and that's when everything kind of bottoms out, right? I have never met an any person in my entire life, I don't care if they're 80 years old, who said junior high was great. <laughs> nobody, nobody thinks that, right? It is not exactly a fun time, but we're trying to figure out who we are and we're elbowing for space. And then by the time we hit high school and college, we're trying to figure out who we are and, and really claim our own identity, what matters to us, what direction our lives are heading. Rarely does the thing that we think about when we're 16 work when we're even 26, let alone later on. And we... we get older and maybe we find that significant other we get married and we have kids and then we get into this weird in-between state where we start to have to worry about kids and parents and then we have to be cared for ourselves and in the middle of this all our identities form and change and morph and that doesn't say anything about the places we come from. One region in a given country versus another, or a different country altogether. The cultures we come from. And over and over we ask ourselves, who am I? And we find out that that question that we are asking when we're teenagers never goes away. Right? And I was trying to think of, you know, that the prototypical, the, the teen movie about identity formation and who am I, that, that, that coming of age movie. What's the current kind of appropriate level movie? And I couldn't think of what that would be because for me, the teenage coming of age movie is always going to be The Breakfast Club and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And, and at one point, keeping up with pop culture was really, really important to me. And that that mattered a lot and today I find myself when I can binge watching 90s and early 2000s cop shows because it feels familiar and I guess that's an identity but it's not just those teen coming of age movies like that we like right it's also I mean think about this 1959 Alfred Hitchcock releases a movie North by Northwest it's a movie about mistaken identity right and we do it with other movies. The Bourne Trilogy. A guy who doesn't know who he is. Fifty First Dates. A comedy. About a person who doesn't know who they are. We even do it with kids movies. Finding Dory. Anyone? This is... The, we are obsessed with identity. And right now you're probably thinking of four or five movies that you think and I should have talked about. Right? 
And we don't just do it with that. We do it with the products that we purchase. I drive this car. It says something about me. I wear this kind of clothes. Are you an Apple person or an Android person? Right? We do this all the time to define who we are. We define ourselves according to our race and our ethnicity. We saw that last week with the Samaritan woman. She was the wrong race and the wrong religion. Oh, and she was the wrong gender, too. And that's why we're doing this series, right? Because all too often, we overlook the place of, of women in the Bible. And we want to define ourselves on our own. But we can't be too unique because we've got to fit in, right? And from the time we're three, I will do it myself, Mom, to the time we're 13 or 16 or 36 or 56 or whatever, we want to define ourselves. And we think if we will define ourselves, then we won't have to worry about what other people think about us and that we will be truly free and fulfilled and I will get my identity. The problem is, it's never enough, is it? Like, we can't ever get there from here. And because none of those things that we use to form that identity are enough. And I was thinking about this this week. I mean, think about the Olympics, all, the closing today. Those people who win medals and don't, and when they're done, when the crowds are gone, who knows? Because who am I is not the right question. The right question is whose am I? Because those are the things that matter. And as I was thinking about this, this passage today, this, this person of Mary Magdalene, we just read that passage of the Resurrection Sunday. I, uh, something came to mind in, in relation to these questions. And the Heidelberg Catechism was written in 1563. And for many of us, it, so, it seems like it starts in a very strange place. But I think it's really appropriate when we look at the life of Mary Magdalene and 500 years almost after the Heidelberg Catechism was written. It starts, the very first question, catechisms at the time were written as a series of questions and answers. And the very first question is, what is your only comfort in life and death? And the answer, the short answer, is that I am not my own, but belong both in body and soul, both in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that is both remarkably out of step with the way that we think today. What do you mean I'm not my own? Of course I'm my own. Our culture tells us not only are you your own, but you have to be your own. But at the same time, when we look at the life of Mary Magdalene, that question of, I am not my own, is completely appropriate. It's true. And we're going to see today that this woman, whose story is unbelievably unique on the one hand, is also the story of every Christian who has ever lived. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your church for the worship that we could participate together in, that we could gather here in your name, people both very different and yet the same. And I pray that this morning we would see your hand in the life of Mary Magdalene and that she would be an example to us as we work through our days and our lives. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, turn a few pages over to your left to Luke chapter 8 for a few minutes. We'll go back to John 20. But John 20 is the last time we see Mary Magdalene. It is the one that we're most familiar with. 
But that's the last time. John 8 is the first time we get to see Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene is mentioned 12 times in Scripture, which is more by far than most of the 12 disciples. And she's unnamed in a few passages, but clearly referred to. And Luke 8 happens probably not too long after the events of that we looked at last week with the woman at the well. And she'll show up again, in, as we know, in the crucifixion and burial, and as we just read, the resurrection. And I want you to kind of keep that image, the, the image of Mary at the tomb, in mind when we read Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. Afterward, he was, he's in Galilee. He was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary called Magdalene. Seven demons had come out of her. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod steward, Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. And I think about the Heidelberg Catechism, bought with a price. And Mary was bought with a price. And that, that's the, the first thing that we see when we, we look at the life of Mary, unlike, well, no, not unlike. Dramatically, we see Mary delivered by Jesus. Dramatically, but in many ways, like us. This passage gives us more detail about Mary than any other. This is all of the detail we get. Mary. By some estimations, the most popular Jewish women's name in the first century. Here's how we know this is, this is one of the ways we know this was too, true. There are at least four Marys in the, in the gospel accounts, and sometimes they're all in the same place at the same time. It's a very popular name. Magdalene. That's not her last name. Okay? It means from or of the town of Magdala, probably, which was a small town on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. That's what we know about her name. Anything more than that that we know is only from these few verses. Now, I'm willing to bet that most of you, like me, when I started thinking about this, think that you know a lot about Mary Magdalene. And what we don't realize is just like the movie North by Northwest, she is often the victim of mistaken identity. So how many of you have heard that Mary Magdalene is a prostitute or was a prostitute? I see several hands. How many think that she is the woman who anoints Jesus' feet? You've heard that too. And, prob and possibly that that is the same person who's the sister of Martha, Mary of Bethany. Have you heard that one? Yeah, we've all heard those things, and that's not surprising. And none of it's true. None of those things are accurate, but most of us have heard some part of that. And so me, being me, as I was studying, I'm like, okay, where did that come from? Why did that happen? And as near as I can tell, it's all the fault of Pope Gregory I in 591. Because he gave an Easter sermon, and he identifies that Mary Magdalene is Mary of Bethany, who is the person who uh, anointed Jesus' feet. Now the problem with that is he's, he's conflating probably three women in two different events. And it took until 1969 for the Roman Catholic Church to say, eh, he wasn't right. So here, what, what's going on? You see, in chapter 7 of Luke, there is an unnamed woman who is called a sinner who shows up at the house of Simon, the Pharisee, and, and she anoints Jesus with perfume and then wipes the tears away. Now, 
you go on to chapter 8, in the beginning of chapter 8, and we hear Mary Magdalene's name. Oh, by the way, chapter 10, we are introduced in Luke to Mary and Martha. Okay? And in John chapter 10, there's a very similar incident to what happens in Luke chapter 7, in which Mary of Bethany, sister of Martha, does in fact anoint Jesus with oil, but that is a different occasion. Probably two weeks from the time when Jesus enters Jerusalem. And so, oh, and by the way, that event happened at the house of Simon the leper, not Simon the Pharisee. So it's really easy to see when you have common names and similar things going on, how people get confused. And she is a often a victim of mistaken identity. And it is a reminder to us that both we need to read carefully when we read the scriptures, and second, that we need to make sure that we're not assuming things that aren't actually true. But this Mary with the common name from the small town, like many other small towns in Galilee, is more than just her name, more than a case of mistaken identity. Luke 8 tells us more. Because he says in verse 1 that the, he, Jesus is preaching, traveling, preaching, and then that the 12 were there, right? The 12 are there, but the 12 are not alone. You see, he's gained a following. And many women are with and following Jesus at this time. What does Luke say? They had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses, diseases and demons, from physical and spiritual oppression. And Mary is one of them. And on one level, she's part of the crowd. There are multiple people like her. At the same time, she is unique, singled out, delivered of seven demons, we're told. And Mark 16 also makes that same reference. It's an identifier, a marker on her, but it is not her identity, not any longer. You see, it had been true of her, but Jesus is teaching on the kingdom of God, Luke tells us. And he is healing physically and spiritually because that's what the kingdom of God is all about. God setting the world to right. And so, of course, he is opposed. And she is no longer her own. She is bought with a price. And when numbers show up in the Bible, especially numbers like the number seven, we need to pause and pay attention. Now, sometimes a seven is just a seven, but not usually. Because in the Bible, the number seven means completeness totality, and it's often identified with God. John, for instance, records seven signs of Jesus. Why? Well, that number isn't picked out of the air. It is because those seven signs represent the totality of the miracles, the power of Jesus. And Mary was completely under the control of spiritual dark forces completely. Likely she didn't even know it. She was not her own. And Jesus delivers her. And it is my belief that the seven demons represent the complete opposition of the world and the devil to Jesus and his kingdom. You see, when Jesus delivers Mary, he does so completely. She is completely delivered. And the forces of this world and the spiritual world cannot stand against Jesus. It is a declaration of his power and his kingdom to the world around, I am who I am. And when Jesus delivers Mary, her identity changes. In John's gospel, he uses the metaphor of the darkness and light. And so in John's language, she has moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. She is free to become what she was unable to be before. To be who God created her to be in the first place. 
And Mary understands immediately the depths of that deliverance, just how much in darkness she had been. And she becomes a devoted disciple to Jesus. Luke 8 gives us a little bit more detail before we turn to John. These women who Jesus had healed, who are following him, are supporting Jesus' ministry. That's what it says in verse 3. Actually, it says supporting them from their possessions in the CSB. What does that mean? That Jesus and the twelve are supported by the women who he had healed. They are making the ministry happen. And Mary is one of them. Their own money, and they're supporting this. And anything we say beyond that about Mary, about her life and everything else, is pure speculation. Now, we can probably draw some inferences based on Jewish culture and the time and custom that she's probably not her very own small business owner. We meet other women who are, like Lydia, but she's not Jewish. Well, she's in in modern-day Turkey. She's not in, in the Holy Land. And the fact that this is now in Luke 8, and we've just met Mary in John 20 at the very end, says that she has followed him for some time. She has a certain mobility that we wouldn't maybe necessarily expect. So probably she is single, maybe widowed. We don't know that for sure. Again, speculation. But that's possibly the the case. But what we do know is that Mary Magdalene is truly and completely devoted to Jesus. A disciple in her own right. Not one of the twelve, but a disciple nonetheless which is in and of itself remarkable because first century Jewish rabbis did not have women as disciples, period. Full stop, no exceptions. This did not happen. And the fact that Mary and these other women are following Jesus shows us that what he is doing, who he is, is radically different than anything anyone has ever seen to this point. And the scripture shows us that this is consistent. Not only is Mary Magdalene there at the end, but think about Mary and Martha. That event, shortly after the raising of Lazarus, happens likely within a couple of weeks of Jesus' triumphal entry into into Jerusalem. And what does Mary do? She sits at Jesus' feet. She acts like a disciple. That's what's going on there. This is a consistent, constant fact of Jesus' ministry. And when we're delivered by Jesus, we become disciples of Jesus. This is not something we do. It's who we become. When we choose to follow Jesus, when we are delivered by Him, it's a package deal. You don't get to say, discipleship is for the spiritual people. I'll just hang out here in the cheap seats. It doesn't work that way. If you're in, you're in. But we have this bad habit. We reduce identity to something like the clothes we put on. Oh, I'm going to this concert, I'm going to wear that outfit. I'm going to church, I'll wear this. Oh, I got to go to a wedding? This is the appropriate attire. And we think of our, our identities like things we put on, and that's not what, what discipleship is. Mary's devotion is clear, both from Luke 8 and John 20. She is there to the end. This is what Paul says about the way, what being a disciple means in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. 
Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Discipleship is not an option. It's who we are. We are no longer who we were. And Mary understands this. Frankly, I believe Mary understands this better or at least sooner than the twelve, with the possible exception of John. Because all four Gospels let us know that she is one of the few that is there at the crucifixion, is there at the burial, and is there on Resurrection Sunday morning. Her devotion is steadfast. She does not shy away from the most difficult moment of her or anyone else's life. She stood watching the crucifixion with Jesus' mother and others. And it, my, Matthew and Mark tell us from a distance, and John tells us at some point there's a shift because he, she is standing there when Jesus tells Mary his mother or gives Mary his mother into the care of John. Mary Magdalene is there. You see, she was completely devoted. She watches with another Mary as Jesus was buried that night. She waited through the Sabbath day and was one of the women who went to prepare to anoint Jesus' body for, for burial. That's why she's there in John, in John 20 because they hadn't been able to perform all of the rites the first day of the week, resurrection day. And her devotion to Jesus has not wavered even on that worst day. Still there, a portrait for us of courage and faithfulness. And I don't know what you think about when you think about that, that moment at John 20, what you picture that like. And traditionally, probably in part because of the mistaken identity of who Mary Magdalene is, we see pictures of her as young and tear-stained and beautiful and all of those, those things. And maybe it's just because I'm a little bit of a contrarian at heart, but I like to think, well, that's possible, but what if she's older, tiny, steel-gray hair? What if, if she is absolutely full of compassion and completely distraught and broken by the moment but she's also a little bit defiant and the 12 haven't shown up why well because let's face it they have real reason to be afraid jesus is dead after all but i like to think that maybe mary is like what can these romans do to me now i i don't know probably reading too much into it but she's devoted completely and she has not been alone since the day that she was delivered because true devotion is, is never alone and John's account makes it seem like she was alone if we just read quickly but when we look at the other gospels it's pretty clear at least from the beginning part maybe towards the end she was alone but at least at the beginning, she was not alone. Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, are with her. Luke 24 seems to say that there are others. And the various accounts focus on different aspects. And, and it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And it can be hard to try to get all the details. How do these things fit together? But John is focusing on Mary. And I think that it's because he wants us to understand her devotion. Both how broken she is and how committed she is at the same time. Even in the distress and in the pain. Because none of them expected the resurrection. Right? We read that. They didn't understand. After all, dead people don't rise from the, from the grave. 
Yes, first century people knew that just as much as 21st century people knew that. They probably knew it better than us because they lived with death daily. And she is emotionally exhausted, drained from all that happens, believes that the authorities have taken away the body. Angels have appeared, and I bet her world is spinning. Like, you know those moments of crisis, of tragedy, where you don't know what's up and down, where your brain doesn't function the right way? That's what she's dealing with. Peter and John have come and left. She is alone now. No one understands what's going on. And she sees a man, a gardener, she thinks. Through the tears and through the hair coming down in front of her face, no doubt. Perhaps he knows where, she, where they put the body. And ironically, the one that we so often mistake her identity is mistaking the identity of Jesus. And I have always wondered, how is it that she does not know who Jesus is? Especially because he says something to her. But you can't read the Bible like a science textbook. Because that's not what it is. Because we have to remember the emotion of the moment, the despair, the devastation. The disciples are afraid. And perhaps, I think it's very, very, very possible that the women are the only ones that come because they have less to fear from the Roman authorities. After all, when they first went, Luke's account says that when the women told the disciples they thought they were crazy. They, it didn't make sense. But still she's there. She doesn't know what else to do. Mary. And in one word, everything changes. She knows exactly who he is. And her devotion has been rewarded. Mary Magdalene, the one who was freed, delivered from seven demons, from complete darkness, has been, is the first to see the risen Lord. Think about that. From despair to elation in a heartbeat. An event, a place that no one else ever gets. But Jesus says... Don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended. And we look at that and we go, okay, wait, what's, what's going on? And I, I have to admit that I'm typically not a very emotional person. It's not my personality. I have my moments, to be sure. And some emotions come easier for me than others. But what I notice about this passage is that Jesus does not rebuke Mary for her emotions. That's not what happens. He doesn't deny her emotions because they are part of her devotion. What he does is direct her emotions into a proper channel. Right? Because just like our, our minds, just like our wills, our emotions are part of who we are and they can be out of whack at times right? Happens to everyone. Ever been around a three-year-old? That's what happens. And sometimes, it, but those emotions are, are part of how God made us, right? And yes, sometimes, like this moment for Mary, they need to be restrained. They need to be channeled. That doesn't make them either bad or unimportant. They're part of us, both in our brokenness and in our deliverance. Mary's emotions, like ours, need to be directed or channeled in the right place because, not because her affection for Jesus was bad, but because his job was not yet done. He had other things to do, and the place and the space was different. But Jesus takes her emotions which are driven by her devotion and sets them in a proper course because he gives her a job. Mary is dispatched by Jesus as in given marching orders. 
sent back to the disciples, not for the first time that day. She's gone at least once. Some people think twice. In Luke's account, like I said, said that at first they thought it was nonsense. But now, Mary is sent back again to them. Some have called Mary Magdalene the apostle to the apostles because she is the one who gets to announce to the apostles themselves the resurrection of Jesus. Think about that. Go tell my brothers I'm ascending to to my father and your father, to my God and your God. I have seen the Lord she says, and tells them everything that has happened. Her message, the message that Jesus gives to her, was the message that would change all of them, would change everything. This is more than a, it was a nightmare, but it's over, sort of a message. This is a, everything is fundamentally different now, message. He's alive, but far more. He is going to the Father, to God himself, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. And as I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but recollect from our previous series in Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And suddenly one like the Son of Man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. That is what Jesus is claiming when he says, I am ascending to the Father to my God and your God. He is saying, this is who I am. And Mary gets to be the one to tell the inner circle, the 12 who will bring this message out and change the world. She gets to be the one who lets them know. And we all want our own unique identity. Right? And Mary has a unique place. But in many ways, from deliverance to devotion to the dispatch we're given, her story is our story. It's the story of every believer. As Tim Keller said, Christianity is the only religion, the only system of thought in the entire world in which your identity is received, not achieved. And that's true. It is completely true. Mary shows us that the uniqueness of our identity and what we do is not the point. Jesus is. Jesus delivered her. She was his heart and soul from then on, devoted to him. And he gave her a task, one that she could not walk away from. And she reminds us that we are not alone because what she didn't show up to the grave alone. And she didn't get sent out alone. She got sent back to the body of Christ. She was part of them. From the time that she was delivered, she was never alone. Through the ups and downs, part of a new family, united beyond any identity that she put on because she belonged to Christ, just like they did, just like we all do. To the other women, to the disciples, to all that would come after. Yes, even us. Because in Christ, we are united to God and one another in ways that don't make sense any other way. In Christ, we don't have to earn an identity. We don't have to be shamed by our past. We don't have to figure it out on our own. As Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We are one in him. And Mary reminds us that we don't have to strive because he's already done the work for us. He has delivered us, so we ought to be devoted to him. And we take up the task he has given us because of it.